This is London, England today. This is London before the turn of the century, at the dawn of the age of the film, the radio, the motor car and the aeroplane. Change was everywhere to be seen. No nation, wrote Emerson, was ever so rich in able men. But at this time, two able men came together to quietly influence that change. In a single generation came the age of the motor car, the conquest of the air. Marconi brought to Britain his first wireless transmitter and radio was born, and so was the gramophone. People took to the bicycle, even royalty at cows. The speed limit was set by the new motor car act. It was 20 miles an hour and people forecast doom. The American Wright brothers took to the air in 1903 and in 1904 the first performance of Peter Pan. And the Edwardian Music Hall was ruled by George Roby with Houdini and Mari Lloyd and Little Titch. But now the horse was giving way to horse power and the internal combustion engine. Another revolution and two able men were to influence that revolution. The Honourable Charles Rolls, an aristocrat with a Cambridge science degree, an adventurer, he took to the air in balloons and with equal verve and skill, he took to the racetrack. He also had his own workshop, but primarily he sold cars, and he wanted to sell a British car, the very best. A close friend, Henry Edmonds, introduced Rolls to Royce. Henry Royce had a tough life and started with nothing. Apprenticed but largely self-taught, he became a superb engineer, working from Cook Street in Manchester. He bought a car, a Decoville, it was unreliable, inefficient, noisy and difficult. So Royce built by hand a car of his own which was efficient. Mr. Rolls and Mr. Royce came together and made their first motor car. The man known as the hyphen in Rolls-Royce, Claude Johnson, joined them. They built cars, quality cars. From this new Derby production line came the Silver Ghost, hand built with craft and skill and care. Royce reckoned it to be the best thing he'd ever done. The six-cylinder engine as silent as a sewing machine and the bright work silver-plated. That was Claude Johnson's idea. He was a great man at promoting the new car and the world's press declared it the best car in the world. Motorists and flyers together, the Wright brothers and Rolls. And it was in the air that tragedy struck Rolls in his early 30s. When flying his own plane at Bournemouth, he was killed in an air accident. Royce's health broke down, but his genius was too much to lose, and he continued his work from his sickbed in the country. The Silver Ghost became sought after by the leisured classes, and they made the Rolls-Royce car part of the social scene. But the ghost put on armour in 1914 for World War I and it took to the desert. So perfect, so reliable, a triumph for British workmanship, said the legendary Lawrence of Arabia. And it went to the front in France with the king. To aircraft engines, Henry Royce applied the same exacting standards. They powered aircraft and airships and the aero engines, like the cars, earned a great reputation. Trustworthy were the Rolls-Royce Eagle 8s that powered Orcock and Brown's Vickers Vimy on the first direct crossing of the North Atlantic in 1919. War gave way to peace. The Charleston was the new dance. The Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost gave way to the Phantom. Its reliability and efficiency, the unquestioned qualities of Rolls-Royce cars, made it sought after round the world. Rolls-Royce on the ground, but still in the air, powering the great airship R-100 with six Condor engines. Roaring into the 30s at Brooklands, motor cars took to the track at ever-increasing speeds, among them the Bentleys. It was a time of technical innovation. 
Meanwhile, a new Rolls-Royce Aero engine was developed, which powered, among other machines, the Supermarine seaplanes, which won outright for Britain the Schneider Trophy. It was to turn out to be an important development. It was almost to win a war. The same engine was used by K. Don in setting a new water speed record in Miss England. The same engine was used by Sir Malcolm Campbell, setting a new land speed record. Only occasionally did Henry Royce leave his country house. He was knighted for his contribution to engine design, and he became Sir Henry Frederick Royce, an honor richly deserved. He always called himself a mechanic. He was, however, more a great engineering craftsman. Newspaper boy, apprentice mechanic, self-taught electrical engineer, motor car maker, aero engine designer. He set the standards which still pertain to this day. Sir Frederick Henry Royce died in 1933. He had started a tradition. Nothing changed. The Phantom range continued, the Phantom II and this the Phantom III. Rolls-Royce made the engine and chassis and many coach builders matched the quality with beautiful hand-built coachwork. Today, only one firm, Mulliner Park Ward, part of Rolls-Royce Motors, is trusted to produce the fine coachwork for some of the models. Once more, war came. September 1939, and Rolls-Royce went to war. Their engines powered most of the Royal Air Force planes, the Spitfires and the Hurricanes, with Rolls-Royce murders. The factories of Britain worked throughout the day and night. These engines were at the very heart of Britain's war machine. That Rolls-Royce development in the 20s and 30s, which won speed records, would now, in the 40s, be playing its part, winning a war. Trustworthy, reliable, efficient, powerful, they had to be. Rolls-Royce were at work in every service, for airmen, sailors, and generals. Peace came again, and people's minds and efforts now change direction. Rolls-Royce car production moved to the outskirts of Crewe in a corner of Cheshire, producing the Bentley, the Silver Wraith, the Silver Dawn, which in 1949 was the first complete Rolls-Royce to be built under one roof. And then the Silver Cloud, in 1965, the new masterpiece, the Silver Shadow. It takes three patient, painstaking months to build one of these cars. 80,000 parts go into the manufacture of these machines. Modern technology, hand in hand with craftsmanship. Skilled fingers install the complex electrical system which moves everything from the seat to the unique gear selector. To supreme engineering design is added the traditional standards and quality of workmanship. All his working life, this man has assembled the classic radiator grill. But is it the best way to do it? That's the way Mr. Rice should have done it. These will end up hand-polished on top of that radiator. The spirit of ecstasy emerging from the mold. No, they're not made of silver. Each car is tested in monsoon weather conditions.
No leaks, no seepage. Every engine installed the Rolls-Royce way with care. It will be tuned, inspected, tested at every stage. And from each batch at random, one is taken and run and stripped right down to the last nut, boat, washer and component. How many do they strip? One in every hundred. Do you take it right down? Yes. How would you describe a Rolls-Royce engine? The best in the world. The same meticulous ear and eye to detail, right down to the woodwork. It's all real, from trees, not a plastic mould, but what trees? Californian, uh, Persian and Indian. Basically, three. It's still all put together by hand, I see. Uh, yes, we fit all our wood by hand. Uh, you know, there's no automation at all. Um, each bit is cut with loving care and fixed with loving care. And uh, the lads that fix it, they take a terrific pride in their work. Real craftsmen. Real craftsmen, without a doubt. Painstaking attention to every detail. Even the ashtrays are hand-finished by a craftsman dedicated to his work. But would he ever use one? Does he even smoke? No, not now. Hand rolled, as yet never faster than five miles an hour. As it makes its way to completion, skill, tradition and modern technology have gone into its making. The crew craftsmen keep up the high standards that owners have come to expect. Cars 30, 40, 50 years old and more become collector's items and on occasions such as this come together. They seldom go to waste. More than half the cars ever produced by Rolls-Royce are still on the road today. They are symbols of the modern trend of conservation, an investment. For quality and reliability, British craftsmen have produced something special, exceptional, unbeatable. This car is a Silver Ghost. It was made in England in 1914 and is one of many which were sent in those early days to America. The body was made by Brewster of New York and is called a Salamanca. She's one of the most reliable ghosts I've owned. Not that there's uh, any unreliable ghosts, they're all reliable. <laughs> And that's what every owner has come to expect of his engine or his car. Cars for royalty, the aristocracy and Maharajas. The Rolls-Royce, custom-built by craftsmen for any country, any owner. When you sit in a Rolls, you're sitting on the back of a real first-class thoroughbred, whereas the other cars, you're sort of sitting there on a first-class working hunter. No, there's, there's something about them. In Deutschland, Rolls-Royce, Nummer 1, the Autos is. I think the only magic of Rolls-Royce is that there's nothing else like it. Uh, the Rolls-Royce magic is something similar like uh, the English way of life. The most uh, beautiful car. It's just like uh, sitting in an aeroplane. It's fantastic. Kings and queens ride in them. So did Lenin. Since the Silver Shadow was introduced, it's never been changed for change's sake only when improvements could improve its comfort or performance. Improved comfort and performance are now incorporated in the new Silver Shadow, the Silver Shadow 2, here in Scotland. Everything that Rolls-Royce has learned over the past three quarters of a century has gone into the building of this car. Advanced engineering at its very best. Among the improvements, twin exhausts, revised front suspension, a new steering system, improved road holding 
making road weariness a thing of the past, the fascia is redesigned. A new electronic speedometer, a battery of warning lights, an entirely new air conditioning system, dual level, fully automatic, with finger control override. All come together in the Silver Shadow 2, a car which bears the hallmark of the traditional Rolls-Royce quality and comfort. Technical innovation, superb engineering design, a piece of history. It's a car which, like those before it, will be at home anywhere, here in the setting of the Highlands of Scotland or elsewhere in the world. history and tradition. This castle at Edinburgh is part of the British heritage. So, in its way, is this motor car. Britain, home of the industrial revolution, of invention, of engineers, of craftsmanship, still today is home of another quiet revolution, one that's been going on for over 70 years. This Rolls-Royce is part of it, a part of Britain's history.